Welcome back to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. Today is Wednesday, March 17th, 2021. Let's get started with some space weather news. First, our solar wind speeds are died down now to about 322.5 kilometers per second with a density of 8.3. So that's some slow moving solar wind right now. Not that big of a deal. Uh, we do have two sunspots. They are in the northern sector of our star. The one that is Earth facing now turning away from Earth, uh, that is AR2808. And then the one in the northeastern corner of this that's now emerging from that limb is AR2810. Now, sunspot number is 23. Between the two groups, that is our sunspot number. That's very weak. Uh, in fact, I don't believe 2808 will be a sunspot very much longer. It is definitely decaying. Uh, AR2810 is stable, but it does not pose any immediate threats for strong solar flare. So, uh, again, these are weaker sunspots, and this is what you're going to experience here for the next year or so before things start revving up towards the max. Uh, but <clears throat> after this, well, we'll have to go to grandsolarminimum.com and check out and see what we have coming here in the near future. Our KP indices are currently at a one with a 24 hour max of a two. Our TCI coming in at three points, or I'm sorry, five points seven eight. And again, we are looking at the possibility for a G1 geomagnetic storm on uh, March 21st. There is a slight chance, but there, if you look directly in your screen, you see the rotating sun here. That is what NOAA is watching, and that is a pretty decent sized coronal hole. Now, the tip of this coronal hole, the very top of it towards this equator part of the sun, that is the only direct hit on our magnetic field. But the amount of solar wind that would be pouring out of that rather large coronal hole to the southern region, if this region continues to grow over the next several hours, it is possible it would be strong enough to produce a G1 geomagnetic storm. So we'll keep an eye out for that for March 21st. Um, cosmic radiation coming in at 8.8%. That's a little bit higher than what it was last night. Still no change at the seven day change at 0.3% is up as far as that goes. So let's go check out uh, some more space weather statistics over at thegrandsolarminimum.com at our space weather section. And there it is. Lovely little graphics there. Mari, thank you very much. And here's what our uh, solar actions look like here the past two days. Uh, not much going on there. A couple of minor B-class flares. Again, typical of a cycle when it starts to uh, uptick just a little bit, coming out of a long, deep minimum, and now moving into its next cycle's uh, current maximum. Right now, Things are still on a slow go. KP indices also hanging around the two range or below for the past three days. And there's a closer look at that coronal hole. And I'll go ahead and zoom in a little bit here and we'll, uh, we'll play it. But the reason why I think that we could see a possibility of a G1, this is where a coronal hole would have to be right in this range to affect uh, a direct hit on Earth as far as coronal hole. So you can see that this tip is reaching that region right now. It just depends if this continues to turn towards the western limb. Remember, it's backwards on the SDO. If this continues to widen or expand, we could see just enough, especially if it's even just this round here. Uh, that's going to be strong enough to produce a G1 possibly. So we'll keep our eyes on it. This one might just be a KP of four, but at the same time, uh, this thing continues to expand as it turns towards Earth and now is starting to make its journey away from Earth as it goes towards the eastern limb. Let's check out what we have in store after this. And yesterday we had nothing. Today, in the same region of where 2810 is, possibly another uh, active region that could form into a sunspot. It is a very weak and small region, but nonetheless, it has to be considered, right? Uh, there it is right here. Now, as you can see, this 
is only a sunspot number of 12. All right, this one is 11. So if, it, if we're talking about this region right here, that's weaker than this, you know, that's not much. Uh, and that's not anything to count on for future sunspots. So we may, we may, not saying we will, but we might get a couple days without sunspots. This is stable, but poses no threat to any solar flares. This is decaying. And this has really not done anything yet, so we don't know. We'll put a maybe by this. This could be a sunspot. Still not out of the cards. Like I said, we do expect active um, periods of time where we'll see, you know, sunspots in a consistent basis. We're heading towards a, a maximum. But it's not quite yet there as far as seeing it frequently every day just yet. Yeah, I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty confident as, as slow as this cycle has been, to get started I'm, I'm pretty confident that uh, we are still looking at a very weak solar cycle 25 so what happens with uh, with the Sun solar minimum conditions well we, we can always tie it back to seismic and volcano activity as well not just the climate and just to give you an example here the 14th paroxysmal eruptive episode at Mount Etna since February 16th. 14. The ash plumes have ranged all over the place. We've seen them as low as 9,000 feet, uh, and we've seen them as high as uh, 39,000 feet. Nonetheless, this is quite the eruptive phase as we continue to see Etna spew once again, nothing major, but we have seen some impressive ash plumes from this volcano. This is the part of the Grand Solar Minimum that we will start seeing the uptick of major eruptions from our, volcanic, uh, our volcanoes that are active right now. John Casey said in 2017 to 2037, he believes is the time frame of a catastrophic seismic event in the United States. But also globally, you can betcha that we will see them across the globe in between that time period. How many? I don't know. It doesn't take many of these. Remember, uh, Mount Tambora was only one eruption of 122,000 feet that led to the following summer being considered a year without a summer in the Northeast in 1860. So think about that. One explosion caused the Northeast of the United States to not have basically a summer. A year without a summer. So lots to keep an eye on as far as seismic activity. Uh, yesterday I reported on a 6.6. .6. There was no tsunami that followed it. Uh, no watches, no warnings. Good news there. And then today, Etna blows again 14 times now since February 16th. That is just a little over a month. So, moving on, tonight's uh, headline really is the severe weather outbreak that we're having in Alabama. I'm going to refresh this and see if they've got updated information on this uh, website here. But here, the last update here, fire officials say six to seven homes in Mount Olive Road on Shady Grove Road sustained damage from a tornado worn storm this afternoon. Numerous trees are down in the area as well. Now, this is in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. The, the, this is happening as we speak. Central Alabama is under a tornado watch right now, along with here. Let's go ahead and actually get the watch box up. Just so we know what we're looking at. So Mississippi and Alabama, for the most part, you guys are seeing the tornado watches. How long are we going to have these? Let's go in and see. Let's check it out. Give it a minute here. These watches are until 7 p.m. This is for Alexander City here in Alabama. But here's the deal. It's not just um, 
this storm, a line of storms that we're dealing with right this second. And let's take a quick look at the local radar. The boxes in red are the tornado warnings. And I'm telling you, we've had tornadic activity off and on today. So these are tornadoes, these red boxes, folks. Check this out. That is across central Alabama. Last night we talked about watching out from Jackson, Mississippi to Tuscaloosa. Well, Tuscaloosa got hit with a, a weak tornado, but still, nonetheless, it did cause damage. And I've seen some video on that. I'd show you guys that, but I think a certain video um, company owns it already, and you can't show other people's videos anymore. So don't want to get in trouble there. But anyway, um, let's go back. Six o'clock tonight, a neighborhood in Moundville, Alabama, suffered some significant damage Wednesday afternoon after a possible tornado touched down Wednesday afternoon. Uh, there's video, if you click here, I'm at the WVTM13.com. At 5.52, tornado warning was for Blunt County until 6.30. Strong rotation reported near Highway 231 between Cleveland and Oneonta, movement was northeast. Troopers report multiple trees down on Highway 231 north of Oneonta at County Highway 33. Here's a couple of images of these tornadoes. So a lot of these tornadoes happened here earlier this evening, not too long ago. If you're on the east coast, about, about two hours ago, the action really started to kick off. Tornado warning for Chilton, Coosa, Shelby, Talladega counties until 6.30. And then 542, a severe thunderstorm capable of producing a tornado, was located over a gap of the mountain uh, or near Clanton, moving northeast at 40 miles per hour. These things were moving. And again, the reason why these storms are racing through, there's so much energy right now in the upper atmosphere. So this is not surprising to see how fast these storms are moving through. But you can already see we've, we've been active today already in uh, Alabama, but it's not over, unfortunately. Where is my radar? Okay, I thought I had a radar. I did. Wow, this is like uh, having dial-up. I, I supposedly have the best internet in the world, and this loads like I have a AOL dial-up here. Okie dokie, we're not looking at that. Goodness. Terrible. All right, so let's find another radar. Bear with me, folks. Jeez. All right, we're backing out. Get out of here. This is what I want. This is where the concern is. Go ahead and play this. This goes all the way out to 1 a.m. We're dealing with these storms that were all, these were the storms responsible for the tornado warnings that I was just reading you. Now we're dealing with this back end line right here. Now, you would think that since the sun is down, that these will just dissipate. And right now, this is an improvement to the forecast unless this radar is glitching out. But then you see the reemergence here in northwestern Alabama overnight. So, it's almost like the radar thinks that this is going to have a lull period and then strengthen once again overnight. And the reason for that is, like I said, there is so much energy in the upper atmosphere that even though the sun is down, this is 9 p.m., the sun's been down, this line looks like it wants to break up, and then watch it here around 12 a.m., how it just re-energizes here, right? This is, there's 12 a.m., 1230 into one o'clock. So this this line of storms just reemerges and regains strength across northwest into central Alabama. So tonight is very crucial. Uh, some folks are encouraged if you can sleep in the basement tonight. If you live in central Alabama, I know you just got hit near Selma with a tor possible tornado. Selma is also still on the lookout for tornadic activity, possibly here in the next couple of hours. So uh, we're not out of the woods yet in the deep south. Uh, again, last night I said, watch out Jackson, Mississippi, 
to Tuscaloosa. Tuscaloosa got hit earlier this afternoon. That is another possibility tonight as well as this new line of storm stays pretty strong in the northwestern uh, part of Alabama. Pretty heavy overnight. Not as bad as what they saw earlier in the afternoon, but like I said, this line reemerges and uh, possibly Selma could see a part two of the storm they had earlier. These storms do look like they're going intense to intense, intensify quickly. So we will definitely keep our eyes on this tonight if there's any breaking news. So far, uh, tornadoes, not a lot of damage. The damage that we've seen have been roofs, trees down. Thankfully, no reports of any fatalities. But I thought tonight would be important to talk about tornado safety since we're having an outbreak tonight and possibly into tomorrow as well. I mean, guys, we have a Torcon of uh, tornadic activity in the south. Let me find you a map. We are, we are in this area right here. Is that a seven or higher? And in central Alabama, you're looking at a chance of a, out, of a, out of a 10 on a scale. We're talking nine tornado, uh, a Torcon, I guess is what they call it on Weather Channel. A nine Torcon, which I've never seen that early in March. So this is pretty, um, this is probably the clearest warning you could ever give. You live in central Alabama. You need to uh, sleep in the downstairs of your home, the most, uh, the most structured area that you can get to with no windows, uh, the bathroom for folks who don't have basements, get a mattress and uh, you know, keep it in there with you, get in the bathtub. If the tornado does hit, you wanna all, you know, obviously hold the mattress over everyone in the tub to protect you from flying debris. That is your best option. I know that sounds scary, but at the same time, these storms are not playing around and they appear to be just as intense at midnight than they were earlier today at three, four o'clock. And I said this last night, it's really a, a, a positive thing that it wasn't much hotter than what it already is down there because now you're talking more energy to the storm, stronger storms. These tornadoes have been kind of weak. I've seen some of the videos of them. They're very little, but they're still causing damage, but it's not that catastrophic type of uh, tornadic outbreak. And I'm knocking on wood and saying a couple of prayers and hoping it stays that way. But there is some concern tonight for sure. So tonight I thought I'd talk a little bit about how to stay safe when tornadoes strike at night. Having a plan in place to protect yourself and your family when severe weather is in the forecast is crucial, but perhaps even more so when there is a heightened risk of nocturnal tornadoes. Twisters are one of the most destructive weather events on Earth, but they pose an even greater risk when they strike under the cover of darkness. Preparing a clear, severe weather safety plan in advance of dangerous weather and then acting on it when a warning is issued can often make the difference between life and death, particularly when dangerous storms strike at night. In case of a tornado, a few minutes may be the only lead time you have to seek shelter. And this is accurate. Uh, this is not fear porn. This is accurate. One of the simplest and most important preparations anyone can make to install is you know, the app AccuWeather or any weather app that you prefer. But thank you, AccuWeather, for providing this article. Uh, make sure the notifications are on. Make sure your batteries are charged. Uh, folks, I know some of you have the extra batteries that you can plug your phones into. Those are good to have. Make sure they're fully charged when you know there is severe weather on the way. It says here, a leading independent quality assurance study overwhelmingly concluded that AccuWeather's app was the first to deliver severe weather push notifications from the National Weather Service and time is of the essence and blah, 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 blah. It's safe. Thank you again. But uh, here's some measures to take. Is why is that battery-powered weather radio on hand? In addition, a flashlight, bottle water, closed-toed shoes, big puffy blanket are crucial to have during severe weather outbreaks. You know, not bad. Maybe more than a couple of bottles of water. Blankets or even a mattress can be used to shield your body and head from flying debris. A helmet could also offer protection for your head. Not that we all have them laying around, but if you do, that's good news, right? Having a sturdy pair of closed-toed shoes within arm's reach is critical safety. Caution in the event severe weather causes damage that you may have no choice but to walk through. Again, these are realistic scenarios. Uh, basically, this is talking to you about having a bug-out bag, basically. Leading up to the event, make sure all cell phones and other weather notification devices, like uh, NOAA Weather Radio, 
are fully charged and that your shelter is stocked with food, water, blankets, pillows, and any other items to stay entertained. There's no telling how long you might be there. Again, stressing patients, folks. Uh, nocturnal storm events often come more of a surprise to people simply because they're not, they may not be as in touch with the environment around them uh, during the day. They may be asleep. That's why it's so important to ensure that you will be awakened by the weather warnings issued for your location and to know the appropriate action when a warning is issued. Stay awake through the night by tuning Stay aware through the night by tuning on the uh, weather notifications along with making sure your weather radio is fully charged or plugged in. The AccuWeather app is also available on Apple and Android, again, with the shameless uh, plugs here. All right, so long story short, basically, you want to make sure your phones are charged, have a flashlight with batteries, have some water, have some blankets, make sure you're warm and safe, make sure you have closed-toed shoes within hand's reach. And more importantly, it might be a smart thing to invest in a battery-powered, uh, rechargeable anyway, weather radio. So you can plug it in, it's fully charged, the power goes out, you have a full battery, and you'll still get those important alerts. Uh, and folks, minutes is the difference when it comes to tornadoes and warnings. I remember when we had a tornado scoot through where we lived last summer, and you knew it was upon you, and it was just on top of you now i'm not saying my neighborhood got directly hit but right at the time that the winds really started kicking and the trees were really blowing around it was just a few blocks away from my house so in a matter of seconds everything was calm and just a normal storm and then all of a sudden the trees reacted completely different than i've ever seen gust of wind before so uh, folks you can't mess around with this and i thought i'd share a little bit of information on what to do with tornadoes at night. What if you're driving, right? And you encounter a tornado. Seeking shelter from a tornado under an overpass might sound like a good idea, and it's an idea often captured in films. But meteorologists say that is one of the worst things that you could do. Never try to seek shelter under a bridge or overpass, as these structures can actually amplify the speeds of the winds, and they offer a little to no protection from flying debris. Makes sense. Narrow passages underneath an overpass could cause an increase in wind speed under the bridge. Clark said that they are not completely safe options if you're near a tornado while driving. It's just less dangerous ones. The safest option is always seek shelter in a sturdy structure, especially underground. Uh, it's, that's not really, of course, anyone would want to seek shelter if they're driving. But if you're not driving, you want to what? Stay low, stay in your cars, secure it into your car, seat belt, put your head down below the window, covering it with your hands or a blanket if you have one in the car. You can safely get lower than the level of the roadway, exit your car, and tie in an area or lie in an area using protective covering like a blanket or a tarp if you have one. Lie down and cover your head with your hands. Be lower than the roadway will allow strongest winds to pass over you and give you the lowest chance of being struck by flying debris. So basically, in a nutshell, you want to either stay in your car if you can't get to a ditch, head down, hands over your head, below the window level, and if you can get out of the car safely and get to a ditch, you want to make sure this ditch is below the road level so the high winds will go over you, giving you less chance of being struck by flying debris. So, again, a couple of useful tips, and I thought I'd share it with you guys tonight just for the simple fact that we are seeing the threat of severe weather continuing throughout the night. And let's see if we have any updates right now as we are continuing our live coverage here. Nope, nothing to update you yet on any more tornadoes, but we will break through if we have any reports while we're doing this broadcast. Now, there is your tornado watch in the yellow. The orange boxes stand for severe thunderstorm warnings, and the red boxes are flash flood warnings. The greens are flash flood watches. So lots of areas are in tornado or tornado watches throughout the night. And then, of course, uh, just plain old flood watches and warnings across northwestern Georgia and southeastern Tennessee and the far northeastern part of Alabama. Tonight's going to be a wild one for sure. Uh, a lot of folks here in the South probably wish they could help over here, though. 
Take a look at our drought report. It is not in good shape. So the snowfall that happened here was very helpful. Uh, they got more in this region, believe it or not, but not a lot. So still suffering from a severe drought in these areas. Looking pretty good across the south and across the Corn Belt. Uh, looking pretty good. A slight, slight dry area in Nebraska. I know I talked to Matt Bros not too long ago, and he was telling me how they could use a little bit of rain out there. It's been a little dry, so maybe a little too dry for the liking in Nebraska and South Dakota. Iowa not in bad shape. Most of Minnesota is moderate to light or abnormally dry. Uh, parts of Southwest Ohio looking good. Most of Kentucky, Tennessee, Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, Arkansas. Most of you in the South looks good for planting. And so plant should be right on target for that part of the region. Meanwhile, concerns across the Northern Plains states. Hopefully they get more moisture over the next several days as well. And also wanted to report on La Nina. Yes, it is winding down, but we're still in a La Nina advisory, uh, at least through April through June, as temperatures are still qualified. Now look how long it's been since April of last year. So we are, we are getting ready to approach a year of temperatures of cooling waters. But still, there's a 60% chance of transition from a La Nina to an in Enso neutral during the Northern Hemisphere spring, April through June. Just impressive to me that we have a chance to go neutral during the spring and summer. I mean, a lot of folks thought this was going to be over by March. And here we are still talking about La Nina advisory uh, going into April and possibly early May. But they do expect values to be in the neutral. And what that means, neutral, it's anywhere from zero to point Five. That is going to be right around this vicinity up here. So, you know, you're talking about oh, quite a ways to go. I'll show you where we are if I can. Nope. There we go. So there, there we are. All right. So we're right here. And where neutral it will max out is right here before we get into another El Nino. But neutral is next, and we've known that. I think it's been a pretty cold uh, winter for most folks in the Northern Hemisphere. I'll be curious to see how March ends as well. We're, I mean, think about it, guys. We're halfway through March already. You know, where does time go? All right, let's take a look at the GFS uh, long-term forecast. We already covered the south and the severe threat. That's going to be just tonight, but into Thursday as well, in early afternoon. Snow on the back end, snow, no, no rain at all for you folks in the four corners and the southern part of the United States and southwest where the drought is. Got some snow coming up on March 19th. That's this Friday. Northern parts of Pennsylvania, Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, and eventually in New York City, that rain will change to snow as cold will push further south on Friday, March 19th. But that high pressure system also steers that storm away to where it would not affect the northeast. Usually on a track like that, you would see the entire northeast get affected. But this high pressure cold front is going to push this low off into the Atlantic and keep us dry here in the northeast throughout Ohio. Pretty dry for Saturday, March 20th. Moisture for the northwest, but not enough. It doesn't reach the southwest where we really need it the most. Some snow and rain sometime on Tuesday, March 23rd for New Mexico and parts of Colorado. Again, not enough, guys. There's more than that. The more snow and rain heading to that region by the 25th of March, a little bit better, but still, this area, even where the blue is, the heavier blues, this is an extreme drought area right here. So we need to see storms like this inundating this area. We are just not in that time of year to see that kind of rain. So this is not good for those drought conditions. But as you see, we talked about this last night, we have a chance for more severe weather this week, next week, and then possibly a third system forming by the beginning of April. More uh, potential winter weather across Colorado as well. So this is some wacky stuff. I, I kind of warned it on this that we would see an up and down March and an up and down April where we'll get the the newly deemed tease and freeze. We'll get a couple days of nice spring weather, and then it drops back into the 30s with sleet and snow. 
So let's take a look at our future temperatures here, shall we? And here we are on Wednesday, March 17th. There's your daytime highs for Wednesday. And again, that energy that's already in the upper level was powerful. Just think of how much more powerful these storms would have been if we had daytime temperatures in the 80s. Folks, only mid-70s for most of Mississippi and Alabama today. So that was the good news when these storms come in. Now, as these move out, we have severe weather threat for the eastern part of the United States. And you can kind of see it where the temperatures are as well. This is where our threat for severe weather will be tomorrow. These are daytime highs as well. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at 80 across the coastline, but mainly mid-70s. So these severe storms could get worse as they get closer to the close, close, closer to the coast as there is more heat in the atmosphere as well. So lots of energy, moisture from the, from the Atlantic, and more heat coming in on the East Coast than we're seeing right now could make these coastal storms a little bit strong. We'll have to keep our eyes on that. <clears throat> but thank you anyway let's continue to move on into next week there's friday saturday in the northeast cooling back off but look at this temperatures are looking really good for most of the united states on march 22nd that's monday so that's one thing to look forward to when you head your work week again not bad weather but is that the tease and freeze oh yeah here it comes another cold front trying to make its way through in and march 24th the northwest gets cold like winter is coming back you know, for the most part, the United States is trying to hold it together and say, no, we don't want that cold. But March 25th, 40s and 30s will dominate the Northeast and much of the Plain States and Midwest. But quick recovery by that Saturday, March 27th, we will start to see spring like temperatures. And boy, that's a very welcome sign for those of you who have dealt with winter. Northeast still looking like a raw March, but. Patience as that warmth will reach us at some point. But look at that. March 30th looking beautiful. And temperatures really upper 60s, mid 70s, 80s in Florida. That's perfect. I mean, that's perfect weather for March, guys. Perfect. And heading into April 1st, again, Arctic air trying to make its way into the Northeast. And it's, it's doing a good job so far. But I do believe that we will see that warmth finally break at some time early April where we will start to see some possible 60s here in the Northeast. But right now it's just staying kind of where it should be while the rest of the nation looks like it should be experiencing spring. Now, this is April 1st. This is when most farmers start working in fields. Some in the southern part of the country will be working earlier than that. But looking at the temperatures, 57 degrees where our good friend Matt is on April 1st. Uh, not ideal temperatures for this time of year. You'd hope to be a little bit warmer. And same story throughout Kansas, Oklahoma even. I mean, we're talking lower 60s in southern Oklahoma on April 1st. So there is still that good weather on the round the corner, but you've got to hope that the seasons get their acts together on time to help these farmers get their plant going, dry out in areas that are too wet. And we really desperately need some moisture in the Southwest, in Southern California, Nevada, Arizona, Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, uh, parts of uh, Wyoming, southeastern, Southwestern Wyoming. We really need to see some moisture heading out in that region. Again, not much to talk about. This polar vortex, this polar vortex talk is about done. And uh, I don't have the patience to wait for this thing to load all night. It's had all night. It should have been loaded. My gosh. So, again, looking at this, I see that colder Arctic air weakening a bit. Staying strong in the, in the Arctic Circle, where it belongs at this time of the year. And as we head towards the end of March, we do see a little bit of push here towards the northeast. As if this is like old man winter's last reach. And I don't think he's going to be able to make it. I don't think he's going to be able to make it. He's trying. But this cold air does retreat once again. So hang in there northeast. We should see some spring-like weather by early April. I know that's so refreshing, right? But in the meantime, 40s and 50s aren't bad. I'll take 40s. Mid-40s feel pretty good. Uh, worked outside today or in a home, uh, and it was 40 degrees outside and felt great inside working. So, um, you know, 
we'll take it where we can. I want to give a quick shout out to everybody that's out there tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Knife Collector, how you doing? Shirley, Edward, <clears throat> you know me so well, by the way. Uh, Richard Davidson, I hope everything is okay for you in New Mexico. All is well in your ranch. Very enthusiastic gardener, hello as always. Good to see you here. Lots of new faces like always, guys. Please like and share and subscribe. And if you like what we do here and want to see us continue, go ahead and become a paid member here on YouTube or go over to our Patreon channel where it only costs a buck to join as far as becoming a member at our Patreon network. We also have shirts and hoodies and all kinds of good stuff there at our Teespring store. You can find that on our YouTube channel before you click on our videos. Again, thanks to everyone for tuning in tonight. We'll keep you guys updated on the tornado activity, the severe weather outbreak that is going on right now in the uh, southern part of the United States. Again, if there is any breaking news out there tonight of any large tornadoes or any situations like that, we will break away and uh, report on any uh, updates as far as anything major like that. But again, we got to really watch out. If you live in central Alabama, folks, sleep in the basement if you can. Make sure your weather radio is on. Be prepared. Have shoes right near you where you're sleeping. Have a quick little bug out bag, blankets, bottle of water, maybe some snacks, some crackers, cheese and crackers, whatever you can take. It's portable food. Who knows? Just be ready because you only have minutes when you hear these alerts going off on these National Weather Service radios and if your sirens are working and they wake you up. All right, I hope everybody stays safe tonight. Please leave a comment. Let me know where you're at. If you've experienced any severe weather tonight, please let me know how you're doing. Hopefully everybody is safe and we will talk soon, folks. Take care. Do you like this show? Give us a thumbs up. Want to support us more? Share to your favorite social media platform. Buy a t-shirt or become a Patreon. All links are in the description below.